Hello, uh, my name is uh, Fred Siegerness, and uh, I will try, try to explain what Aurora is. This is a short crash course. Well, in order to explain the Aurora, it's uh, necessary to visit our sun. And the sun is a variable star per definition. It's a massive nuclear furnace burning or fusing together hydrogen atoms into helium and massive amounts of energy. As seen in this uh, time lapse from the satellite SUHO, NASA satellite. Uh, below here is a uh, animation I made myself, shows the sun. And notice here that, uh, that the magnetic field of the sun is carried along with the eruptions of the sun. It's kind of frozen in with the mass that is erupted. And this mass is a gas of equal amount of electrons and protons. So the effect is that it's like you take the water hose in your garden and start spinning it. And then you notice that along this magnetic field line on the sun, there will be a uh, flowing plasma out or solar mass. Um, and also notice that the interplanetary ma magnetic field or the magnetic field of the sun is either pointing downwards or upwards. And this effect is very important when it comes to what happens when this solar wind hits Earth. Luckily, Earth also has a magnetic field formed like a dipole. Here we have the day side and here is the night side. When the solar wind arrives, it's important to notice the direction of the solar magnetic field. In this case, it's pointing upwards. And the solar wind just blows past this system because there is no a connection between these magnetic field lines. So you get a, a compression of Earth's magnetic field on the day side here, and the magnetic field of the Earth is dragged into a long tail on the night side. If the magnetic field of the solar wind is pointing downwards, then everything opens up. Then you get a reconnection between the magnetic field lines on the day side, and solar plasma is allowed to enter these magnetic clefts, forming day side aurora here on the day side. And on the night side, the, the solar wind is dragged into the tail, and then it reconnects again over here and are shot back with high energy, forming night side aurora on the, on the night side of Earth. And also notice that these impact areas, due to symmetry of the whole system, are formed like ovals, where the center is the magnetic poles. Well, let's have a look at the aurora itself. Over here, you see a auroral arc, and it stretches from around 100 kilometers of altitude up to maybe six, 700 kilometers of uh, altitude. Uh, the arc is mostly red on top and more structured green as you go further into the atmosphere. So what's happening over here? Well, the uh, solar electrons or protons, uh, here I have marked it as the primary electron, will, as it's guided by the magnetic field of the Earth, collide with the atmosphere upper atoms. And uh, so we have a primary electron hitting a, for example, a oxygen atom, which has eight electrons spinning around its core. Uh, after the collision, one of these electrons will be kicked in up into a higher orbit. And when it falls down, it will emit light at a specific wavelength. If the energy is uh, uh, relatively low, the light that will be emitted is red at 6300 Ohmstrom, as you can see at, in the top of the aurora arc here. If the energy is higher, then the electron will penetrate further down into the atmosphere and the light will be green at uh, 5577 Ohmstrom. 
if the energy is really high, it will hit a lower edge of the atmosphere around 100 kilometers of altitude, where the atmosphere is becoming more dense and heavier. We will have, for example, molecules presence. And uh, the light emitted from these molecules can be seen as fast moving blobs, uh, mainly red or violet, moving along the aurora curve. There's a short animation I would uh, like to show you uh, explaining the, uh, the effect. Uh, here's Earth, it's rotating. We have a day side and we have a night side. And we are luckily protected by our own magnetic field. And look here, here comes the solar wind and it connects with the day side uh, magnetic field lines. And the solar wind is accelerated towards our atmosphere and creates day side aurora on the day side. And look what happens on the night side. Then the magnetic field lines are reconnecting and are shot back, forming night side aurora on the night side of the Earth. And since these impact areas, uh, since they're symmetry, these impact areas are formed like ovals where the center is the magnetic poles. Okay, let's have a, a closer look at the aurora oval. Here you have a correct view of Earth, if you ask me, where the center in this image is the uh, magnetic pole. And we have a fixed coordinate system where 12 magnetic local time is always pointing towards the sun. So we have the day side and we have the night side. The data you see here is from a American NOAA satellite, and it clearly defines the poleward border and the equatorward border of the aurora oval. Uh, also notice that Earth is rotating beneath this oval <coughs> with the center, of course, in the geographical pole, around the geographical pole. Ah, furthermore, the, uh, the Russians uh, had a bunch of ice drift stations during the Cold War that actually measured these borders using all sky camera data. Later on, the Americans did the same things with the satellites. The size and location of this aurora oval is highly dependent on solar wind conditions. And there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between solar wind conditions and how disturbed the magnetic field is on Earth. And we measure this uh, uh, geomagnetic activity as a function of Kp index. Okay, uh, let's have a closer look at geomagnetic activity. First of all, these curves shows the local variations of the geomagnetic field as measured from KHO. The green curve is the vertical component. The blue curve is the horizontal component, both measured in nanotesla. And the red curve shows you the deviation measured in degrees of the horizontal component. Note that if we have no aurora, these curves would have been totally flat. Now, if we measure the maximum disturbance of the horizontal component during a three hour period and subdivide these measurements according to this table over here, we can define the local K index. So zero K means uh, uh, measurements in the region zero to five nanotesla and everything above uh, 500 nanotesla disturbance of the horizontal field means K index nine. Now, if we calculate the weighted averages, average of K indices from a network of geomagnetic activities, we can define the Kp index or the global Kp index, the planetary Kp index. And it tells you how disturbed is the global magnetic field. And furthermore, if we use satellite data from satellites that are located one hour upstream in the solar wind, we can also get the predicted Kp index. And that is what the, the NOAA Space Weather Prediction Center gives us. Uh, prediction times are up from one hour up to three days. Well, with the Kp index, we can easily calculate the size and the location of the aurora oval. And that is exactly what I do 
with my app named the Aurora Podcast 3D. With this app, you can locate the Aurora Oval and, this, and look at the size of it from anywhere on the planet. The app is made for Android, iOS, Windows, Linux, Ubuntu, and Mac OS. You are free to download it if you want to. The app is based on the Space Weather Prediction Center that gives us the KP index three days ahead in time. So please use this app to locate where the Aurora is, where you are located. And with that, I end my Aurora crash course and wish you all happy Aurora hunting.